Welcome to Change the Narrative. I'm your host, J.D. Fuller, an African-American, licensed psychotherapist, professor, diversity coach, consultant, and author. We talk about the isms. We talk about the phobias, anything that marginalizes and oppresses. Everything we are not and everything we are is because of fear. Through a mental health lens, we'll have difficult conversations with celebrity guests, political activists, and everyone in between. Our mind will tell us whatever we want to believe, but the truth lives in the body, and that's where change occurs. Are you ready to change the narrative? <laughs> well, thanks for uh, helping us out, Erica. Appreciate you. Ready to go whenever you are? Okay, cool. So how have things been? <clears throat> Daniel, my man. Good? Everything's good? <laughs> Everything's yeah. good enough? Yeah, you know, yeah. life keeps lifing. But I... But I'm so happy to see I'm you. I'm happy to see you as well. Feelings mutual. <clears throat> it's good to be seen too. And, uh, um, and have, yeah, yeah. And not yeah. behind a fence somewhere. <laughs> I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> um, hold on, check. Erica, is Daniel sound okay? It sounds a little echoey to me. Okay, I just want to make sure he's sound. Okay, right on. All right, so I'm back to being excited to see you. And uh, I'd say it's fair to say it's been a bit of a co roller coaster ride since Absolutely. I last saw you. For is sure. that fair to say? Definitely. So my question is, what was the, let, you know what? In fact, let's go back to come forward okay. just to summarize the past. So what was the bottom line reason for you losing your professional baseball career? If you had to sum it up, what would it be? Without a doubt, uh, drug addiction. I mean, I lost everything to drug addiction. So um, that's really it, you know? Yeah. That sums it up, huh? Yeah. Okay. All right. And then let's skip forward to you being in prison and getting through your time. You know, drastic changes went on for you in yes. prison. And it doesn't happen overnight. Agreed. Agreed? So, and, and that's the thing too, is like, I went to prison on two separate occasions. So the first time I went to prison was, I believe for, I was sentenced to 52.6 months. I ended up going almost four years on that. And that experience wasn't nearly as bad as the second experience. So the first time I went to prison, I didn't really get involved with like the subculture of how prison is. You know, sent to a work camp. I was just pretty much kept to myself. Time went by. I spent a lot of that time in the county jail, too. So um, I didn't spend much time actually in prison, maybe two years. Um, so it kind of like was, you know, it, it blinked and it went by. You know, it wasn't that experience wasn't that rough. But the second time I went, that's when it got progressively worse. And um, I mean, it has a way of. I think hardening you over time. Like, mm -hmm. so my experience in life prior to prison, like I wasn't exposed to a lot of, um, you know, the ways of, of the subculture of how prison operates, you know, like it's a completely different code for living when you're, when you're incarcerated. So. Is it, so how would you, how would you describe your upbringing before getting hung up in drugs? Um, I mean, I definitely had some abandonment issues as a child. My biological mother left when I was a baby and I was always raised to believe that my stepmother was my biological mother. So I found out through a birth certificate and that's what um, really upset me because there was no communication in my household. So like we never talked about anything. I think my parents and the lady that I called my mom and my dad, they just assumed that, you know, I knew that my mom wasn't my mom and I didn't. And um, there was a time like when I was playing basketball in front of my house and these two girls come riding by on a bicycle. One girl points to the other girl and says, Daniel, that's your sister, Rebecca. And they keep riding. But like, I had no idea that I had a sister named Rebecca, you know? And um, the fact that obviously she was in my neighborhood told me, like if I'd have been like consciously thinking about it back then, I would have probably connected the dots and realized that she lived right down the road from me my entire life. But when I found out through the birth certificate, wow. that kind of like became like my fuel, like that was my motivation. And 
the things that I would tell myself and even like I told my Little League coach was that one day I'm going to play professional baseball. And I even said the Atlanta Braves because that was my favorite team as a kid. One day I'm going to play professional baseball for the Atlanta Braves, so maybe my mom will want me. And um, I'll never forget that moment. But, again, we never talked about it in my house. So I think eventually um, it just led to, like, even when I signed that contract, it, it wasn't fulfilling for me. So I still I still had that emptiness inside of me. And that's what addiction was for me. It was just filling that void, you know, like, the drugs were the symptom of a much greater problem, which was obviously me. And me was the inability to cope and effectively communicate and the emotional maturity. You know, I still had the emotional maturity of a, of a little boy and I was born into adulthood. Mm. And, and um, you know, at that point, like I didn't know how to live outside of a sheltered life. You know, my life was pretty sheltered as a kid growing, growing up, you know, like, I wasn't exposed okay. to much and my parents always took care of everything. I didn't have to pay bills. You know, I didn't, I was fortunate to where, like, I wasn't rich, but I was fortunate to where my dad said, if you make good grades and you excel in sports, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll pay your insurance. I'll pay for your car, your gas. So, um, and that was always a fight in my household too, because my stepmom, the lady who I called my mom would always say, no, he needs to learn a job and learn responsibility. You're going to spoil him. He's going to become entitled. And um, so that was, you know, an ongoing fight, but yeah. Um, so then you got, wait, so then you got uh, locked up and you did two years County, which I've never heard anybody say that that was well, a I sat time, in the but... County jail um, awaiting okay. trial and I oh know County jail is definitely, it's not fun. You know, it's definitely not yeah. fun by any yeah. means. And I mean, you're locked down into a, a, a dorm for, you know, two years straight mm-hmm. without any exposure. We had zero mm-hmm. exposure to sunlight, you know, like that's how it was tough. There's no doubt about it. But I guess when I'm comparing it to how bad it really got my second time, mm-hmm. it was relatively smooth or okay. easy, but no, not by any means. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Like this whole I- yeah. idea of incarceration in and of itself is just, to me, it's barbaric and archaic, like everything about it, you know, um, so wait, wait, I want to get into that a little bit later. I just want okay. to finish your story. So, so then in prison, you had a, 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 just a life altering change. Will you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So in prison, um, I was sentenced the second time in prison, I was sentenced to a work camp and it was Avon park. And, um, I met a guy there by the name of Rashawn Clark and I was getting a wall street journal sent into me and we were both from the same area and we we're in the same dorm. So typically people in prison, if they're from the same area, they might, you know, link up or click up a little bit and talk. So that kind of started our conversation, Mm -hmm. but we were both, you know, from different walks of life and he was sentenced to prison at the age of 16 for 20 years. And here I was my second time in prison, um, constantly in and out of trouble, but we developed a friendship while we were in there. And it was over this newspaper because he, he wanted to learn, you know, um, really wanted to learn about like investing and stocks and, and stuff like that. So like, that's kind of where our conversation started at. And, um, I was, it was right around the time too, that Trump was running for president. And, you know, I, I share this to people now too, even here and people like, I'm I'm in an ultra conservative, um, community, but they get upset when I say this, but it's true because at that time, Trump was running for president and he was so much different than what everybody else was that I was accustomed to. And like, and like I was gung ho about Trump and I, I would literally go around to black people in the dorm, like in on the, you know, at the camp and say, you know, like, this is the best thing that could happen to America. You know, like Trump is, is what, you know, we need, this is what black people need. Like, um, I remember getting the Candace Owens book sent in to me cause I was reading a lot too. And it was like, you need to get off the democratic plantation. Mm-hmm. Like, I would say all these things. Like mm. I was really like that emboldened to say these things. And, um, and it was funny and it's kind of sad when I think about it, but when I would talk to Rashawn, like he would, he would allow me to speak to him and say these crazy things, but he would always like throw these nuggets out there and throw these nuggets out there. And, um, and he would tell me that you underestimate me. And uh, for somebody that was in prison since the age of 16, the, the amount of knowledge and wisdom that he had, like just 
to this day blows me away. And I wish I would have got it then, but I didn't get it right then and there. But when I look back on it with the studying that I've done, like I learned a lot, but there was a time that he got put on a work squad. So in prison, you have to work. Like, and in Florida, they don't pay you to work. And Rashawn got placed on a work squad. And uh, you have to go to what's called ICT. And you go meet with the classification officer, the major's there, they give you a job assignment, then you come back to the dorm. And uh, when he came back to the dorm, he says, I'm going to confinement because I'm going to the box, is what he said. And I was like, what do you mean you're going to the box? And he said, uh, he said, they put me on a work squad. They put me on a DOT work squad. And I was like, okay, well, what's wrong with that? Like, that's good. You get to go out to work. You get to be away from this place. You get to be, you know, see the free world. You get to see civilian people, maybe even occasionally get a meal or something from one of the officers out there. Like, so much better than being in prison because that's kind of the mindset in prison is that if you're at least working, it's like people feel like, okay, well, we're not in prison. And it's like kind of how people have been conditioned, mm -hmm. you know, like they've been conditioned to believe that, um, you know, being out on a work squad is a little bit more freedom than actually having to sit in a dorm all day, but not with Rashawn. And his mindset was, and he told me, and I'll never forget it. And, and I wish I would have really grasped it then, but he said, uh, he said, it goes against everything I stand on. And I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, it's modern day slavery. And, and when he told me that, he goes on to tell me, he goes, the 13th Amendment is the abolishment of slavery, except when punishable by a crime. And uh, it didn't hit me as hard as it hits me now, but with what I know, but just realizing like this guy like stood on what he stood on and how much knowledge he really had and how much I really did underestimate him. But um, we developed a, a, mm -hmm. a strong friendship in there. And I was like involved doing like all the wrong stuff in prison. And he was doing like everything you're supposed to do, like just really like a model inmate, you know, um, just kind of kept to himself, was always reading, always studying, working out. Like, and I was involved in the stuff that you really probably shouldn't be involved in. And he would tell me, like, dude, you need to get it together. You've got a wife out there that loves you. You've got family that loves you. Um, you're very fortunate. And so there was even a time where an incident happened where somebody came at me with a knife. And um, he got upset because I didn't go tell him about it. And he was like, dude, why, why didn't you bring this up to me? And I was like because you're doing everything that's right in here and I'm doing everything that's wrong and I'm not going to drag you into my mess, you know? Um, but ultimately I ended up getting transferred away because of this whole incident. So I was put under investigation. Uh, they ended up shipping me to a whole nother camp, but um, I told them though, before I left, I was like, I promise you when I get out, like I'm going to remain friends with you. I'm going to keep in contact with you. Um, you know, you're a really good dude. I, I, and I, consider you a friend and people hear that all the time in prison you know like oh yeah i got you when i got out yeah. you know I'll, I'll shoot you some money or i'll write you mm -hmm. or and um but i really did so how's he doing now he's how's your Sean doing? getting closer to home so he's in a, a wastewater uh program now so he's what does that they what have that a mean? wastewater mm -hmm. management so they they yeah so oh, okay. they, like yeah, yeah. teach you a trade and so he's He's doing that okay. and he should be eligible for work release by, I would say the end of this year, I believe around. Yeah. So, oh, man. and he's trying to get his know. probation off of him. So that's the other thing we were able to raise some money for him and get him an attorney. And so uh, with that attorney, they're trying to at least see if they can get the probation taken off of him because him and his brother were sentenced to the same crime and it was an armed robbery mm -hmm. in which nobody was hurt. They were both juveniles. So Rashawn was 16. I believe his brother was 17, about to be 18. His brother was the possessor of the weapon. And there was another girl involved. And I believe she was like 25. And um, she ended up turning state on them, on the two brothers. Yeah. Oh, and wow. so she got completely off of this mess. And then he got, his brother got sentenced to, initially got sentenced to like 23 years with, 10 years probation and Rashawn got sentenced to 20 years with 10 years probation. But his brother was the one that was the possessor of the weapon. That's why he got a little bit more time. He was supposed supposedly like the ringleader and his brother, you know, took credit for the crime. He said, you know, it was me. Rashawn didn't have anything to do with it. And even the department of juvenile justice recommended that Rashawn get treatment, you know, get him a program. But 
the judge ended up giving him 20 years. And so his brother goes back on a motion. So they, his brother appealed because there was a plea offer on the table from the attorneys for 15 years and they never got this plea offer. So nobody ever told them about it. And we've got jail records of Rashawn showing that no, there was no attorney visit. You know, we got all the visitation log, everything showing that there was no, no attorney came to see him to even tell him that there was a 15 year offer on the table. And, um, so when his brother went back, on the appeal, the judge gave him the benefit of the doubt and said, you know what, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt that the attorney didn't tell you that you had the 15 year offer. They commuted his sentence to 18 years and took away the probation. Rashawn went back on the same exact grounds, the same exact evidence, you know, it's the same exact case. And when he went back and it was a different judge though, um, the, his judge said, no, I don't believe that the attorney didn't tell you that that you had a 15 year plea offer on the table. So he now he ended up being sentenced the most harsh, the harshest sentence, but the least culpable because his brother's the one that had the yeah. weapon. He was also the older one. He was also the ringleader and said on record that, um, that Rashawn didn't, you know, wasn't involved. So it's a, uh, and that is, that is one empowered, motivated yeah, brother. I'll without a that. doubt. Like I've never met, I'm talking about even out here. Like I've never met a person like the world is his when he gets out. Like I told him that, like there's, there's no doubt I'm, about I'm, it. So, I'm praying for him. Um, because of how he's used his time in there. And it's rare that you yeah. find somebody who goes in at the age of 16 and doesn't succumb to the gang life or the subculture of prison. Like you don't yeah. see it. And he's one that, I mean, he's just, he stays like super focused. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. We went to Sean well always. So I want to go back to when you first uh, got released from prison, you came out and immediately blew up on social media. What, what was that timeline? Uh, I mean, so I'm talking about uh, within months. So it it's is crazy, and, right? Um, my TikTok had blew up to like 300,000 or something, which they ultimately ended up banning, banning that account. And they said hate speech. So I had to start all over. So, but um, yeah, it was crazy. It, and it happened so fast. But even after when I left Rashawn and I got sentenced, or I got shipped to another camp. The camp that I went to was like ultra gangland. Like it was everybody there was in a gang. And um, ultimately I ended up with, at the same time of the politics of what was going on with Trump and everything. And the way gangs work in prison is, it's a lot different. Like even white supremacist gangs in prison, like most of the members in prison, they'll be like, we're not anti-black, we're just pro-white, you know, like just, and that's yeah. kind of like the rhetoric that's used, mm -hmm. but really in closed circles, many of them, you know, say a lot of racist things, but I, so when I ended up running with a bunch of these people when I was at this camp, you know, and I just kind of, without much thought into it, kind of assimilated into like this group of people. And it, mine was really based on the politics. So like, you know, the, the, the atmosphere out here in the free world at that time was just crazy. It was at the height of the Black Lives Matters movement, the whole Trump thing. There was a lot of racial tension. And the same was in prison, you know, like there was a lot of racial tension, especially at this camp that I was at, but, and I would justify mine that, that I was that guy like, oh, I'm not anti-black. I'm just pro-white. I'm, you know, like white men are mm. discriminated against today in America. Like we're being oppressed. Like we're the ones that are, you know, it, you can't be a white, straight Christian male in America today without really knowing anything at all. Like just being so uneducated in, in the matter. Um, so like, yeah, that kind of happened before I came home. So when I came home and I got in contact with Rashawn, he had me look up the whole 13th amendment thing. And he told me to read the new Jim Crow. So I came home and I read the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. And that book completely just changed my life and it changed my entire perspective on politics, on and that's what made me leave like the whole Republican party. It made me look at criminal justice system differently. It made me believe in systemic racism, not even believe in it. Like, cause I know that it's true because I have the experience of being in prison coupled with the data and, and just the real history of America. And I believe that's what really, um, made the whole social media thing blow up because when 
when I got that information and I shared, like, it was like a light bulb went off in my head, like immediate. It, yeah. Yeah. That's what it seemed like. That's yeah. what it seemed like. And I happened. shared that information with the world. That's when things just kind of like took off for me kind of crazy, you know? And, and it got, it got big fast. It was yes. a lot to manage. And, and, you know, I could, Im- I would imagine with the childhood trauma that you hadn't really mm-hmm. dealt with, you know, you had already been on the high end with, being with the Atlanta Braves and then you dropped off and now you're back and you blow up again. I would imagine that that inner turmoil had to be managed and you didn't, you yeah. had a hard time managing it and you didn't really have enough support to manage That's it. That's absolutely that fair 100% to say? correct. I still hadn't done the work like, you know, in, in mm-hmm. recovery for me was an inside job and mental health and all that was an inside job. And you got to think too, like here I was this gung ho right wing conservative Republican who all of a sudden had a change of heart and belief system. And I'm so excited about it that I'm sharing it with the world, but you got to figure the people closest to me were not okay with that. And that's where it got hard right. is because family members and friends and the community that I'm in, you know, like we went to lunch here, like you've seen, like this community is like, mm-hmm. so people, I got a lot of hate for the things that I was saying and, you know, what I was going through. So without doing real work with myself, my own mental health and taking care of myself, ultimately ended up having, you know, I ended up self-destructing, you know, like that was always my MO, you know, self-destruct. And yeah, it was a slippery mm -hmm. slope for you. And, and so when you felt yourself sliding down in real time, were you aware of it that you were sliding? No. And I, and I never am, even though people will tell me, and you were telling me there was a, a few other yeah, people. My what? wife was telling me, like, people were telling me, like, the, the sensors were going off, the lights were flashing. But if I don't stop and slow down myself, that I didn't have the tools to do that, you know? So, so in retrospect, you remember me reaching out to you and saying, I'm worried about All you, the time. what's going on? Yeah. All the time. Okay. Yeah, I definitely okay. remember. I remember the, <laughs> the text messages and, you know, the social media messages. But, you know, life was just happening at 100 miles an hour. And I crashed, you know, and it could have been bad. Yeah, it could have been a lot worse than what it was. And again, like I'm super grateful because, I mean, I could be off in prison for another 10, 20 years right now, you know. So it got pretty bad for you. You slipped, mm-hmm. you crashed, and you ended up going back to jail. No, or prison. no. So I had I had about a Just week last relapse. Time. Um, okay. During that time, I was charged with a fleeing and eluding. So, um, okay. but they never got the person in the car. And so the person that was in the car got away. And so when they arrested me on it, they had no, there was no evidence to say that it was me because it wasn't even my car. Mm-hmm. Um, but really there was a, a APB out on me that I was a threat to myself. So like my family was worried that I was going to end up, you know, committing suicide that like, that's really where the fear was. So the cop was trying to pull this car over that they thought that I was in because they were worried that I was going to commit suicide. Well, the person in that car got away from the cop. So when they took me to jail on this trial, I was like, that wasn't me in the car. And they ended up, um, dropping the charge because they had no evidence on, on the case. But, so that could have been so crazy. I, yeah. So ahead, that no, could have been something crazy, you know, like, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I just watched this great documentary called Bobby Joe. Everybody should watch it. It's about this woman and her story of addiction and recovery. It's truly unbelievable what she went through and her father's death was the catalyst for her finally flipping the switch this time what was the catalyst for you therapy therapy is what changed my life that was the key therapy 100 yes. percent changed my life H- having Excellent. access to mental health that. resources like they put me in mental health court it's the first time the courts so whenever because i they violated me for probation because of the relapse you know and um mm-hmm. and i really wasn't the person driving that car but I know who was driving that car, but anyways, that's neither here here nor there, but they violated my probation though, because I was out past curfew. So when I did go back to jail, um, they ended up putting me in mental health court and that right there was just life changing. Like if they would have did this 15, 20 years ago, the impact it probably would have had on my life because 
I had access to therapy. I had access to a psychiatrist. I had access to medication. You know, all these things that I've never had before. And it just made a huge difference. Yeah, they need to expand that and, and uh, do more of that to provide people with the mm-hmm. support they need. Talk about talk about how being in a white body has altered your story of success from far too many others who aren't in your skin. It's just opportunity, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously you've heard my story and just the amount of opportunity that I've had that I know that other people don't have, you know? And that's really what Mm -hmm. kind of changed my perspective is because even when I used to hear people talk about white privilege and I'd be like, you know, that's not real. I've had my own struggles in life. You know, I didn't grow up rich and not really understanding what, you know, white privilege meant. And so once I, I started to really dive in and do the work of, you know, deconstructing and learning how to become, you know, anti-racist and then really just understanding myself because in return by doing that, it, it helped me learn myself and, now I'm no longer the victim. You know what I mean? Like, and I, I was victimizing mm. myself all the time. Like, and oh, I'm oppressed and this and that. And, you know, these courts and, you know, if this would have been different and it just, I felt like it empowered me, you know, because now I, it changed my perspective and it made me appreciate life a lot more and have a lot more respect for, you know, the opportunities I have, um, the way that I've, been able to even have access to mental health court or be in the system, you know, like, um, because I've met too many people that haven't had the number of opportunities that I've had. And the fact that like, even when I got released from prison, most people come home from prison, they have $50 and a bus ticket. And, you know, I was fortunate to come home to a brand new house and a car and, you know, um, opportunities with work that most people, you know, don't have those same opportunities. So I believe that's really what changed my mindset more than anything was just you know one word is opportunity because that's really what it comes down to yeah i appreciate i appreciate your honesty let's talk about enslavement of uh in the prison system a little bit more what does reform prison reform look like to you what's your perspective oh man like mine is so strong that most people probably wouldn't be ready for it, but like, I, I'm an abolitionist. Like I believe the whole prison system should be abolished. I mean, cause it's, it's predicated on slavery. So that entire system is predicated on the 13th amendment, the abolishment of slavery, except when punishable by crime. And then um, if you look at involuntary servitude and you look at convict leasing and, and, um, and you see the way people are treated in prison, it's the same exact thing when you're, you know, you're being leased out to these private companies or your labor is being leased out to these private companies or even the state, you know, um, jobs. There's still um, an element of, of slavery there where you're not being paid for your work. You know, in Florida, they don't pay anything. On average in the United States, I believe it's like 86 cents an hour that inmates make, you know, Crazy. over $14 billion of um, labor that's stolen from them. So. And then when I just look at the statistics and in, in the history of the United States, so right after the abolishment of slavery, and you got the 13th Amendment, except when punishable by a crime, you have the Black Codes. And so the Black Codes literally started targeting Black people for nothing other than essentially being Black. Mm-hmm. If you don't have a job, which no white person would give you a job, if you're out past curfew, if you're um, loitering in the street, you know, you name it, you, you're arrested. And slave labor was such an integral part of the Southern economy that without it, you know, the economy would collapse. And I still believe that's true today because you see prisons in so many rural areas, you know, and it props up the economy. So even if it's not a private prison, which only 8% of prisons in the United States are private, but even state ran or federal prisons not being private, but they're still propping up the economy because Most prisons are in predominantly white communities, and these are poor white communities because they're in rural areas. So now you're providing jobs to people in that community who otherwise wouldn't have a job. And now these people are going to shop at the local Walmart. They're going to shop at the local Home Depot. You're going to bring industry there now just because you're – I've literally been at prisons in Florida, and the majority of the prisons in North Florida, they're all 
ran by three families, you know, like, so the entire family's working at this prison, you know, generations of it. You've got mm. the dad, the, the daughter, the, the son, the uncle, the grandpa, all working at this prison. So when you look at it from that perspective, and then if you look at the numbers of who's predominantly in prison and the whole gerrymandering of prison, even in Florida, because in Florida, if, if you've got these prisons in predominantly white communities and you're extracting black and brown people from their community and placing them there. And now you're doing a population census there and you're counting them there and, and the population for the voting power, the representation, but you're not giving them the ability to vote. So now you're giving that district twice the voting power, twice the representation while diminishing the representation of the community that they're coming from. So like, there's just so many ways that you can see like the politics of white supremacy and it all centers around the criminal justice system. And that's why I believe that the wow. criminal justice system system is the epicenter of systemic racism because, and then if you look at even after the black codes, you go to the Jim Crow era and you still have segregation where black people are arrested for drinking at certain water fountains or sitting in certain seats on the bus. And you're just, you're mm -hmm. taking black men and black leaders and you're putting them in jail and now you dismantle the Jim Crow laws because people uh, use it as a, a way of trying to feel maybe morally superior. I don't know, you know, because really they just it just continued to evolve in disguise. When you dismantle the Jim Crow laws, you pass the Civil Rights Act, you pass the Voting Rights Act, you make it no longer you can discriminate based on race. But if you look at from 1970 all the way up to recently there's been a 700 percent increase in the prison population and that's not by accident you know you start militarizing the police you start right. um defunding the schools and and you create the school to prison pipeline and you have this war on drugs that's created and all this is right after the dismantling of the jim crow laws and of course, who does that disproportionately impact? It's the black and brown community because now you have all the cops policing this community. Um, you start redlining all these all these districts, and the schools are funded based on taxes. Well, the the property value is not high, so now you don't have the taxes to fund the schools. So now you don't have the education in, uh, in these communities, and you create the war on drugs. Like in, in 1986, you had Reagan pass the Anti Drug Abuse Act, where you know you got five years for five grams or 500 grams of powder cocaine, but you get five years for five grams of rock cocaine. Well, where was the rock cocaine predominantly back in the eighties in the black and brown community? Right. So you just see all these signs and, and even the 94 crime bill, it's just harsher sentences, you know, and you started getting all the minimum mandatories and the fact that, and this number blew my mind because all this, and I didn't get all, like, I didn't get this information like this isn't, you know, stuff that I came up with. And the credit goes to the book, you know, the new Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander. And, you know, when I watched the 13th by Eva DuVernay, like that stuff just blew my mind. Because when I seen history for what it really is and the, and the fact that one in three black males carry the convicted felon label as opposed to one in 17 white males. But what do black people during the Jim Crow era and convicted felons of today have in common all the same barriers so it's no surprise that one in three black people have this convicted felon label because now when we can no longer discriminate based on race like we could during the jim crow era in the age of so-called colorblindness then now you just discriminate by making increasing the number of convicted felons and any white person like myself and that's what i saw is that statistically that that system wasn't designed for me you know it was designed for black people i became mm. collateral damage in a system that was designed for black people and so when you see that one in three black males carry this label and well what does that label mean you have barriers to voting you can be disenfranchised you have barriers to housing you have barriers to education you have barriers to employment um you can be denied loans you can't put your name on financial documents like all these things that convicted felons face because of that one label and it's and the reason why is because it never ended you know racism never ended slavery never ended it just continued to evolve and a lot of people think it's a class issue today and i think brian stevenson said it best that yeah um wealth not not wealth not culpability shapes justice in america well where's the wealth disproportionately 
what communities are disproportionately in. You know, who's been robbed of the most generational wealth? So of course it's, you know, you're mm-hmm. gonna see the numbers skew in a, in a certain way. So when people even tell me, and that was the other thing I used to argue, um, it's the culture, it's the music, it's the fatherless homes. And, you know, like these were all the talking points that I used to say, but like when you look at a system that was designed to oppress for so many years and it's still doing it, and you're, you're taking fathers out of the home, and, and put them in jail, you know, yeah. like you're, you're robbing families of, of generational wealth and, and even the music and, and the industry, like, you know, like who, who's running the industry and, and, and what's that as a result of people were rapping about what they really were living, you know, it wasn't the other way around, you know what right. I mean? So like when you're, you're, it's just insane, really all the information that I learned. It is insane. So, Listen, it is insane. And you wrapped that up so well. I didn't even want to interrupt you. That's so good the way you laid that out because you answered a lot of people's questions and you canceled a lot of those talking points. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate it. I want to ask you one question before okay. we shift gears. Tell me what you know now that you wish you knew then going through all of this turmoil in your life. Mm. I would I don't know. I mean... I think communication, like being mm. not being able to communicate of how I'm really feeling, like of what's really going on inside of me. I think that was a big fear of mine for the longest time. You know, like okay. I would always keep everything inside. I wouldn't talk about it. Um, that and I, I mean, and the education, you know, the things that I were taught as a kid, mm-hmm. you know, and not even just in school, just in general in life, you know, like, um, but I mean, that's it. Like I tried, it is. Yeah, that's important. Is. So I don't really, I guess I don't really think about that question too often um, because I try not to live there, you know, and think about the what mm-hmm. ifs, you know, if I'd have done this differently or, you know, the regrets because my life has been filled with regrets, you know, with the decisions I made in the past. So like, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's been a tough one to even think about. <laughs> But it's not, you know, I, I hope you know that it's not about what, what you did wrong. It's about the lesson you learned and you've learned mm-hmm. plenty and communication is, mm-hmm. is a big one. I mean, I think also communicating yeah. when you're not okay. I think it's okay to be a man yeah. and not okay. I think that was something that was really difficult for you to mm-hmm. be aware of, to be right? in touch with my feelings and emotions and, and be okay to talk about them. It yeah. doesn't make me less of a man or it doesn't, you know, like that, that's definitely a big one. And it was toxic masculinity ran rampant, like in, in my household and, and just community in general, it's just. And, and in reality, we all live with regrets. It's what we do with them that counts. So you're not the only one. So I want to normalize yeah. that a little bit. Let's get to, let's get to the company you're working for. Cause it's very exciting. Will you talk about yeah, it? So in how I got there was amazing too. So I was in mental health court. I'm a convicted felon and my skill set is not in anything other than marketing or sales or, you know what I mean? Like that's kind of what I did my whole life. Yeah. So like, um, but it was hard for me to get jobs. So like I came home from prison, I started trying to get a job at like Target, Home Depot. I applied in all these places. They denied me. Um, but my case manager recommended that I go to this organization called Project Lift. So I go to Project Lift. They teach trades to felons um, that are either coming out of prison or they teach trades to troubled teens. So it's just like an alternative to the normal school route. So I was like, okay, um, I guess I'll try this. Maybe I'll go try a trade and see what I can learn. And so I go there, I end up meeting this guy. Um, and he starts telling me about tiny homes and building tiny homes. And, uh, so he tells me that he's building, he's manufacturing shipping containers into tiny homes. And I was like, wow. Like, and, uh, and I was like, the way the housing market's going today, like I, I just immediately in my mind, like saw so many applications for this, you know? Um, so he asked me if I wanted to come work for them, I would go work in the back and, you know, swing a hammer and, you know, learn traits, you know, stuff that I've never done before. So I get there and that's what we're doing. We're literally manufacturing 20 foot and 40 foot shipping containers in tiny homes. So, um, you know, repurposing and these are new containers and um, 
we're going through a, a rigorous certification process now that inspects these things to make sure that, you know, there's no lead in the paint, there's no pesticides in the floor, there's no chemicals that have been spilled in it. Like, um, but so, because that was a question I had when I got there too, but the name of the company is called Containing Luxury and the guy Blake is super supportive. The guy who owns the company's name is Blake and he's super supportive of, he's a second chance employer. And um, so he's super supportive of, you know, convicted felons and addiction and people in recovery and mental health. So that was a huge plus. And um, so I get there, I'm working in the back. He asked if I want to come up front. And I was like, absolutely. Because the way my wheels were spinning was like, right now with the housing market and people not being able to afford anything and um, people, I know that what it's like to be homeless. I know what it's like to be incarcerated and come out and not have access to housing. I was like, dude, we got to use this company for good. Like there's so much good that we can do with the application of these homes. You know, like there's a lot of homeless people out there who have nothing to sleep in, um, you know, unhoused people. There's a lot of people transitioning from incarceration coming out that don't have access to housing that need access to housing. So I started reaching out to, um, you know, different people, but the county commissioners ended up, you know, coming and check us out. And that kind of like snowballed. That's what started it. So that our local county commissioners came out and saw what we were doing. They were like, dude, this is really a thing. And um, so I started creating videos on social media about the shipping containers turning into tiny homes. They're fully insulated. They're framed, plumbed, electrical. Like these things are turned turnkey ready whenever they leave our facility but the 20 foot is like 160 square feet it's small you know but it's it's like a, a studio mm -hmm. apartment it's like an efficiency and you give someone their own space okay. they have access to a full shower they have access to a full toilet um kitchen uh with a sink you know cooktop microwave refrigerator everything so um we started partnering with nonprofit organization that they specifically help people get housing that are homeless and so we're getting ready to do um 26 homes for them we partnered with a municipality out of south carolina that um that hasn't gotten any love you know and it's an impoverished community it's in a rural area and um we're partnering with them and it's a predominantly black community too and um and, and that was so great because even when i talked to them and like being able to like understand a little bit better of how so um you know being able to to provide housing solutions to communities that have been priced out of housing and to people that have been priced out of housing and these things are nice now they're, they're not like your typical yeah they're I've super seen them. nice yeah no like, i've seen them but like <laughs> I, the owner of the company is a licensed general contractor and and he Ooh. was building like million dollar wow. kitchens for these people in Palm Beach. And he kind of had like a coming to God moment. And he was like, you know what? I'm serving the wrong people, you know, like, cause these people were never happy with like, you know, what he was doing and they were always demanding. And so he, um, during COVID, he went out to Texas and, um, was out in the woods and started toying around with this idea of building shipping containers into tiny homes. And he built like this whole compound out there. And it ended up selling like that in, in a day. So he took that money, he liquidated all that. And he came to Florida and he said, you know what? We're going to start providing housing to people who really need housing, who can't have access to housing. And these things are like hurricane built, you know, impact rated. They're um, strongest thing. They're like all the materials that we're putting in, like we're, you know, the same cabinetry that he would put in these million dollar houses on the island. He's putting in these containers, but he's, so we call it containing luxury, but there's like some affordability to it too. So it's like the intersection mm. of, you know, luxury and affordability. And, um, so that the 20 foot's like a, a studio apartment, but the 40 foot's a little bit bigger than it could be like for like a couple, um, small family, mm -hmm. you know? So we kind of, what's it like, Daniel question. What's it, what's it like? So they mm -hmm. buy the container, um, and do they have to buy land? to put it on so, or are there so that's the that biggest work? issue obviously was land so like when we were, we started doing all this we figured okay like land is going to be the biggest problem because who you know not a lot of people own land or have access to it so our goal is to start building communities of these because when you're building okay. them one off yeah. 
you kind of lose the affordability because the amount of permitting that the government makes you go through and all the surveys you have to do. And I learned so much about construction, you know, in a short amount of time working here, but um, it just makes more sense for everybody involved when you're building yeah. entire communities. So like, that's the plan. And we want to build like agri huts, which are like self-sustaining farming communities. So like where you literally have everything that you, all the, the landscaping is all edible. It's not ornamental. And um, yeah, so that's kind of, that's a big, that's, that's a big vision. It it's an purpose. amazing, again, amazing. You know, like purpose. I felt like I finally have purpose in yeah. my life again. Cause when I got stripped from baseball, I had no identity. It was like, what do I, who am I? And um, being able yeah. to really do something to be able to give back because these things are 75,000 or less, you know, like you're not going to find something mm -hmm. that's hurricane rated, especially not in Florida, you know, um, the yeah. 20 foots are like 35,000. So, and it's like a little studio apartment. Somebody's going to pay that in rent in one year, you know? So if we could get the government so, to maybe start providing land, that's like really the goal. If they can yeah. provide some of the land, you know, then we can go in and, and put these homes in there at a super affordable price and, and give people an opportunity, you know? Um, you said something about, you know, there's additional barriers that come in with trying to get the government to provide land. That's another way that they, you know, hold oh, yeah. poverty, you know, because, because creating access is the answer and yet they won't create access to have an answer. So that's how poverty feeds the economy. So I love that you guys are figuring out a way to and try to combat that. You see how much know? land governments have. Like I was shocked at the amount of land that like the county owns and, and they're not doing anything with it. Mm -hmm. Like you could literally take people off the streets and put them in homes right now, but you're like hoarding this land for what? And some of these properties have like super high amounts of like tax liens on them and stuff like that, that these people will never come own this land. But, um, and that's why I'm grateful to work with the community that we're working with out of South Carolina, because they get it. You know what I mean? Like, and they, they totally understand the entire process and they're like, whatever we got to do to help people. So like to have a job to where obviously you got to make money to survive. Like one thing about capitalism is like, you've got to learn how to live within it. You know what I mean? So, um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, like, I don't want to be greedy. And that's something that like I've passed on to the owner of the company too. I was like, you got to stay true to the mission of keeping this affordable, you know, serving the people that really need help because that's, what's going to make you blow up anyways. You know what I mean? Because there's very few yeah. people that yeah. are genuinely trying to help people out there, especially in today's world. Like everybody's <laughs> looking to get rich. So that was that, is that the, the cat or the dog? And going nuts. I think they're probably hungry. That's why. But all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. let you feed them. But I wanted to say a few things. One is that I love I love that you found your purpose in this work. I can see how mm -hmm. happy you are. I can see how you know you're glowing again, and I'm super excited for you. I'm really really happy for you, you and your family. Um, I'm glad we were able to coordinate this time and catch up because it's mm -hmm. been so long since we'd really been face to face. So that's really cool. Most importantly, I'm glad you found your way Thank back. You. So I continue to wish you nothing but the best. And, you know, after my last interview, I mean, my last interview, after your last interview with me, my audience jumped on you like nothing. So I can't, I, I can't wait for them to find you again and see what awesome. you're up to, man. They, they went to town on your, on your uh, yeah. social media. So give up your social media Instagram handles. Is confessions of a convict. And then I had to change my TikTok, so because they banned that account. So my TikTok is just my name, Danny F. Collins. So that's the two. And then Containing Luxury is on all platforms. Containing Luxury is on YouTube, um, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, everything. So excellent. I, you know, you never stop surprising me about how you're changing the narrative in an ongoing way. You know what I, I appreciate from you, you and again, just so happy to see you. Not What'd you learn from changing the narrative, but it's changing our approach to the narrative. And that was something that was huge That's for it. me because I came at it so full steam ahead. And you kept telling me like, slow down because people closest to me weren't ready for it. Like, and if I'm too much and too combative, then nobody's going to listen and they're going to shut down and put these walls up and it just created fights. Like that's what it did. So like, not only is it changing that narrative, but I learned from you to change the approach to the conversation as well. 
Yeah. I appreciate that, my man. It, it, let's stay in, in contact, obviously, and I'll hit you awesome. up when the Thank show you. drops. All right. Great to see you. Great